Welcome to a well-designed business with your host, Luan Nigara. Luann has a lifetime of experience building a multi-million dollar business with her husband and cousin, and she knows the challenges you face in your interior design business. Luann brings you real-life answers to your most pressing problems, as well as practical strategies to explode your interior design business. So, let's get to the business of interior design. Hey everybody, welcome to A Well-Designed Business and another episode of Power Talk Friday. I have Michelle Williams on the show with me today. Hi Michelle, how are you? Hi Luann, I'm great. How about yourself? I'm great, thank you. And I'm so happy that you came back on the show. And for anybody who might be a new listener to the show, you might not know that Michelle Williams was originally on our show on episode number 137. And Michelle is a gifted business coach. And on that show, we talked all about work scheduling, productivity, and chunking our days. You know, Michelle's background includes the financial software industry as well as a business as a soft window treatment fabricator. She has a B in business administration, a diploma in Christian life coaching, and she is one of the very few certified profit first coaches in the U.S. And this is exactly why I invited Michelle back, because I had learned about profit first in this past year. I heard Mike Mikulau say it again for me, Michelle, Mike, how do we say it? Michalowitz. Okay. On the Biz Chicks podcast podcast. I've got a lot of tongue twisters happening with me today. Um, But I was very intrigued and I like the concept. And I was in the last couple of weeks thinking, "Hmm, I should reach out and see if I can get a connection and get them on the show. And then I thought, wait a second, I think Michelle is a profit first certified coach. And sure enough, I went back to my information on you, Michelle. And I thought, what better way? Because right here, we, I love the idea and the concept of profit first, and I wanted to bring it to the interior design community. But then this is a slam dunk. I mean, because you know our community, you're from our community, you specialize in coaching our community. And I thought this way we can learn all about profit first and learn it in context to what it is that we all do every day in our businesses. Right, Michelle? Exactly, exactly. So why don't you just first give us uh, an explanation of what Profit First is, just so that anybody who this is a new term for them and a new concept, of course, the book is out there, and we'll talk about that uh, uh, later in the interview. But just set us, set everybody straight so they're on the same page that I am with at least understanding the concept. Okay, sure. Um, so Profit First literally is um, bank balance accounting. And so what we mean by that is it is a system to allow us to pay ourselves or pay our business first. And um, the way that that it works in, in extremely simple terms, it would be like if, let's say you were a young person and you got paid and you immediately put, I don't know, 10% and a savings account, right? Mm -hmm. That's taking it out and saving for yourself first. And it's taking that same habit and putting it into your business. And if you don't mind, Luann, I'd love to just tell you like two seconds about how I got here. Sure. Um, You know, when I first started my creative businesses back in 2000, you know, I think I mentioned on one of the last podcasts, I was working really hard, but I found out I wasn't making a lot of money at the end of the year. Then I realized how to make money. So I'm making money, but I had not paid taxes. So then I got hit with this tremendous tax bill and thought I was going to be ill. So we had to come up with $18,000 plus, you know, more tax bill for the estimated taxes going forward that I, of course, didn't have because I hadn't even paid the ones before. Um, And forget saving for retirement. And so I just... I got to a point where I was like, wait a minute, I'm making really good money, but the, but the number, I was an LLC at the time, but the number that is showing in my net profit, right, that bottom number, I can't spend 100% of that number or I'm going to be in trouble. Right. So then I started kind of separating out my money. This goes to taxes. This goes to an IRA or a 401k, and this goes over here, and um, probably about three years ago, Profit First when it first came out, I found the book and I saw it and I'm like, oh my gosh, Mike is is teaching, you know, extremely close principles and systems to what I've been doing and incorporating with my clients. Um, I had been doing a little bit more on the spreadsheet side instead of firm bank accounts. And so I reached out and I was like, 
oh my gosh, I'm like, you could be my brother from another mother here, Mike, because <laughs> where is it? I mean, even, it, it was so freaky, even some of the examples that he used in the book were examples that I had been using to teach with. For example, why are we eating crumbs when there's a buffet? Just all kinds of things. That's crazy. So long, yeah, right? So long story short, I hooked up with them, went through their process and their training. And um, Profit First literally has, I've just seen it revolutionize businesses within the interior design and window coverings industry, w- within many industries. I actually have helped implement it and mm-hmm. others as well. But because this is my main focus, and, and I just think it's not enough to make money. We have to save money to reinvest in the business without impacting our salary. Mm-hmm. So I, I just love it because it, it helps us make money and manage money. And who doesn't love that? Right. right? Well, and the thing is, it is the I think it's probably the hardest concept for a new business owner to grasp is that that understanding of making sure that you have money put aside for taxes and making sure that you you know you understand it when you're an employee of a company you go work for right. you know H and R Block or whoever it is and you say okay yeah. what's my four hundred one k give me give it take it right off the top out of my paycheck like it's clearly we get that as people as 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 people out in the world but then when you go to open your own business people like they forget to do that it's like hello where's your party <laughs> right oh, oh my gosh so yeah. you know you said for people that are new in business you know I. I, I might be really stepping on toes, but I'm going to tell you that a lot of the people that I've worked with have been in business 10, 15, 20 oh, absolutely. years. Right, right, so right, it's right. not just a, a new business issue. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll tell you why, why I'm seeing it. And, and it's so prevalent. We, um, many of us are creatives who are starting these businesses. And as you've talked about, and you've had it multiple times on your show, we wear so many hats mm-hmm. and this happens to fall under the HR hat at least the piece of saving for taxes and 401k because your HR department, right? Your payroll department would be the one that did that. Mm -hmm. And when you are acting as your own payroll administrator, yet you're not running through payroll, it kind of clearly slips our mind. And um, it just is getting us into good habits of where's the money already promised so that it's not spent twice. Right. And also too, I think that, it not only is, I mean, there's two, I think I noticed there's two traps that, like you said, I said new business owners only because I thought when they start out new, they don't develop this habit. And then that that's that's when you want to get them. And, and of course, if somebody just comes up, upon it 10 years later and recognize they're in that same cycle that you mentioned that you were in, then yeah, get out of it and let's do this. But I think the thing is that it's not only that you have the one dynamic where a business owner doesn't recognize that they're the ones that need to do it. You also have the dynamic where the business owner falsely believes because they have a bookkeeper or an accountant that they're going to do it. And that's not the case. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? It's just not always the case. (laughs) Very true. You know, bookkeepers and accountants are are, are phenomenal. And and I love them. I work with a, a whole host of them. But they are literally going to use the numbers that the business owner gives That's them. That's my they're point. Going they to just do, record it. Yeah, they're, and they're going to do what, what you tell them to do. To do. <laughs> right. Exactly. exactly. So if, if the business owner isn't thinking, I need to save for this or I need to do this. And, right. and you know what? I'll even take a step back and tell you that, that you know, many business owners in our industry – don't know even how to read their financial statements. Right. And here's what they all tell me. My accountant or bookkeeper sends it to me every month, so I know it's being done. But they could not read the story of their numbers mm-hmm. if, if they had to. Right. And the, the profit first comes in, and it actually works with our normal way of looking at our money, which is let's go, let's see what's in the bank. Because <laughs> most business owners don't think, oh, every day, let me go pull up the p and I mean, I do. I'm weird. I love to, <laughs> to pull up my profit and loss and balance sheet. But I'm, I know I'm not in the norm. But most people, when they make decisions, Luann, they go right to, you know, Wells Fargo, Chase, whatever their banking online system is, whatever. They pull it up. They seize their money in the account, and then they make a decision. Right. And so the problem is, is when all the money is in one account and you're looking at that online, it is really easy to say, I've got money right. in the bank and not really understand how that money is being allocated or where it's already or been you promised. you need to allocate it, right? Exactly, right. exactly. And and I can tell, you know, another way that clients come to um, 
me in particular or to the need of Profit First is they'll say, I have a lot of money sitting in account. So this is not always I don't have money, right? right. I have a lot of money in the account, but I'm fearful to pay myself because I might need it one day. Mm. Well, that business is still not working for them because they're building out this stash <laughs> of money that they can't even bring into their home. It's crazy. And Profit First just helps separate all that out so that when you bring money into your home to spend, it's free and clear and you don't have to, to – Put money into the account, take it out, put it in, take it out. I, right. I, that just gets crazy. Yeah. And and that is a real thing, what you described as well, is that when somebody is looking at a chunk of money in their bank at the end of the year, it's, it's – I mean, you know what it is it's a it's actually a smart business person who recognizes you can't just empty it out like it's there and empty it out but but right. it's not smart to just say well I'm not going to take anything cuz you know basically that person is stuck there's not they are not they're That's not right. having an understanding of all of the things that need to be paid or allotted and therefore be, without that understanding they don't know how much they can take for themselves so it's it's just as bad as not having money as having it and not like, understanding how to take it right right it's like not having it at all it exactly. does nothing for you i mean it's a little bit better than not having it but <laughs> Right. You know. But not much. Uh, right, exactly. <laughs> you know, well, because at least if you find the answer, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, so exactly. so Profit First starts with um, a description of the old way of looking at yes. things. And Mike uses the concept gaps, you know, and tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So gaps is generally accepted accounting principles. And that's just the accounting principles that we all have heard. If you were to ask anybody to tell you a definition of profit, they're going to say whatever your sales are minus all of your expenses, whatever is left over is profit. So gap tends to see profit as a leftover. Profit first sees profit as something that we take first and then we spend what's left over. Mm. So in other words, take your total sales pay your company, right, yourself, the profit first, and then what is left is what you have to spend. Now, this is super important, and I know for some it may seem, you know, a little flaky. It's not, and we're not changing anybody's QuickBooks or accounting, so let me just, like, you know, clear that up at the, at the very beginning here. Mm -hmm. We are not changing the way you're doing your accounting. What we're doing is changing the bank accounts that money gets allocated to. We're changing the way that you are making your spending decisions. All right. Okay. And so just to, to take this one step further, once you've moved the profit out, and we're not talking an enormous amount, we're not trying to rob the company. It's nothing like that. It's you know, we'll talk about in a little bit an analysis so you know what percentage or what number for profit you're going to be moving out. But it's seriously just like saying when the money comes into your house, it, let's say your mortgage is the most important thing, you're going to pay the mortgage first, and then what's left is what you're going to use to run the rest of your home on, right? Right, right. You're not going to say, hey, let's go on vacation, let's eat out every night, and hey, if we happen to have a little bit left over, pay the mortgage. Right. That's just not what we do. And so having profit in the company is extremely important. It is, um, number one, it allows the company to grow. It allows you to save money, like, you know, three-month expenses or whatever it is you need to save. It allows for capital investment, and it allows you to do these things to weather the storm, if you will, to deal with risk without impacting your salary. Mm. And so if we don't separate out pro company profit from owner's salary, it's really easy for us to take the money into our home and then have to put money back in and go back and forth versus letting the company kind of um, subsist on what it's earned. So the profit goes back. Some of it may stay in the company, and then some of it comes to the owner as a distribution for, hey, job well done. You took a lot of risk, and you get a profit distribution. So it's important that we save and plan for that instead of letting it be the leftover, right. which is what gap does. Okay, I like it. And so the question that I wonder is, do we need to, Michelle, first talk about and explain the concepts of total revenue, real revenue, the Parkinson's law, and all of that before we talk about the instant assessment? In other words, do we yes. need that? Okay, so we need that understanding yes. before we do the assessment. Okay, because I wasn't sure the right. order that we wanted to go in. Yeah. So, yeah. so then tell us about some of these things so we can you know, you know, know, get the most out of what you're saying. So we have to understand total revenue versus real revenue um, versus gross profit. You got it. So profit first does use some terms 
that are um, different from what we might normally see on our profit and loss statement or income sheet, okay? So we also know if you've looked at more than one P&L, some say total revenue, some say total sales, some say, you know, gross sales, whatever. It is the total amount of money that comes into that company for sales, right? Any right. type, product, service, whatever. So that number is still the same in Profit First as you would see on um, your profit loss statement, okay. total revenue or total sales. On our profit and loss statement, we would see COGS or cost of goods. And in true accounting speak or principles, that is, you know, product or subcontractors or even sometimes your own employees if you're doing job costing, you know, any of their labor hours that went into the final product that, that, you know, of course, is leaving your business and going out the door. So it includes, you know, not only hard costs, but it includes the labor cost of your employees if you're allocating it that way. In Profit First, we only do materials and subs, which means we're only using hard materials, which is a cost of good, and we're only going to use subcontracted services. So in the Profit First way, we're not including any employee job costing or employee labor expenses as part of cost of goods. And that is important because what we want to do is get down to the base cost of the product because we may end up having, you know, to redirect funds on the expense side, and employees are a big part of that. And so we don't want to include it. So in profit first, under materials and subs, which you can kind of do a dotted line to cost of goods, they're very similar, except that materials and subs does not include labor for, from your employees. So okay? if you're billing an assistant out at $85 yep. an hour, that's not in this line item? Correct. Okay. Correct. And if you're a service-based company like many of our interior designers and, you know, we, you would count, let's say, if you subbed out to uh, your installer or you subbed out to your window treatment specialist or you subbed out, you know, to an upholsterer or, or whatever, that would be considered, but not if you had, and we would count design hours as income, but we would not be counting all the employee hours for your assistant or for yourself. Okay. Okay, not under COGS or not under un, not under materials and subs, but in okay. the true sense of the word, it would be part of COGS. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. even if that's not the way, because most of our designers, they don't show that under COGS, but in the truest sense of the word, it could go there if you were doing job costing. All right. Okay. So on your P&L, you would see total revenue minus cost of goods is gross profit. On Profit first, you would see total revenue minus materials and subs is real revenue. And what we mean by real revenue is that's really what your company is worth. That is really the money that you have to spend managing and running your company. And I want to make this distinction because I have, um, you know, business owners all the time who will tell me they're a million dollar company or two million dollar company. But after we take out cost of product and subcontractors, they're a $250,000 company. That's what they have to run the company on because they may be product heavy, COGS heavy, which we are a lot in our industry, right? Okay. Interior design is super product heavy. And so because of that, they're really not a million dollar company because they don't have a million dollars. They're a $250,000 company okay. because that's what they have to manage, you know, the running, if you will, the day-to-day -day management and the salaries and the expenses of the business. And it is really important that we know that real revenue number because that's what we have to spend after we've covered subcontractors and cost of product. Okay. So that's the big differentiation there. Okay. So I want to run through it. So what we're saying is that if we're an interior designer, we have, say, one employee, and we are going to, in our profit and loss statement, we are going to have allocated all of the product we bought, we have every sofa that we bought mm -hmm. from Kravit, every wallpaper we bought from Tebow, whatever it is, we're going to have every vendor that we paid. We hired a tiler, we hired a window treatment person, we hired a painter. All of that's yes. going in there, but we are not going to allocate our hours or our designers, our assistant designers hours or our bookkeepers hours or anybody else's salary that we're paying into that uh, materials and subs account. right correct because then what happens is when you deduct the materials and subs total from your gross 
sales, your gross revenues, your total revenue that you brought in that year, what you're saying is, let's say, just for silly numbers off the top of my head, let's say you do all that and you're left with $100,000, okay? Correct. Now what you're saying is of that $100,000, that's your pie that has to now pay your employees, your taxes, your our, our, our gas and electric operating expenses coming out of that pie as well. Everything. Right, exactly. Correct. So Correct. if we only have $100,000 left and we still have all of those things to come, we're not going to earn $100,000 that year. It's Correct. not possible. And what you're saying is that's how you look with your eyes wide open on what you're doing and you get clear on can you afford an assistant or can you not, right? And also you get clear on what what do you have to change? Do you have to get tighter in your expenses? Do you have to push the revenue higher? You know, because if you have Correct. set a goal for yourself on what you want to earn, it has to come from figuring out where all the pieces of the pie are in, at present, right? Correct. Okay. Um, I, I kind of have this this little saying that I say that the way that you're going to make money is you got to sell the right product or service to the right person at the right price, and then you got to manage the money. Right. It's not enough to build top line if we're spending it all. Right. Right. right it right, right, still right. doesn't trickle down. Right. So it, you know, I've even had some companies that I had to tell them to quit selling, and that sounds completely counterintuitive. But every time they were selling, they were getting themselves into more and more trouble and deeper, deeper, deeper debt, and so. You know, it's not enough to sell as much as it is to manage cost of goods or materials and subs and then to manage expenses. It has to be managed. And that's where Parkinson's law comes in. And that's why. um, So let me explain that and Mm -hmm. tell you then why we take profit first. So Parkinson's law says that our demand upon a resource tends to expand to match the supply of the resource. So, for example, if I were to tell you, Luann, you've got two weeks to get this project done, how, when would you do that project? (laughs) You, right? When would you do it? Well, I can, I'll be very honest with you. I will look at it immediately and assess, first of all, do I need 10 hours, 10 minutes to do this? And depending on that assessment, then I might depend on when I start that project. Right, exactly. (laughs) But, but chances are, you're going to expand, and it'll be done in two weeks right. when it's due. I'm not going to do but it today I, and turn it in tomorrow, even though I have two weeks to do you know, Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, and that, so that's Parkinson's law. You're using the time that you have. But if I were to come to you and say, Luann, this project is super important, and to meet you know, the client's needs, we have to have it done tomorrow. If it were within your ability to get it done, you'd do it. Clear the decks and do it. This has to exactly. be done. <laughs> exactly. So it's that same, that's the way we all live our life. See, this is the human behavior. Right. Um, it, it's kind of like, you know, Mike uses in the book or talks about toothpaste. You know, if you've got the great big tube of toothpaste, when you first start, you're like doing the whole, I call it that aqua fresh scoop, you know, <laughs> where you do the big swirl. And by the time you're at the end, it's yeah, like yeah. a little dab of do ya. You're just trying to get minty fresh breath, right? You're not trying to, you don't care that they're scrubbed. You just don't want to have morning breath all day. So you use what's dab available. Will do ya. Right? That's so awesome. That but you know be. what I'm saying? It's so the truth. Use the resources that are there. Okay, Mm -hmm. so that same thing happens even in my own home. I can tell you, if I have cash in my wallet, I will spend it, (laughs) and I won't know where it went. At the end, I'll be like, I had 100 bucks. I don't even know what I spent. It might be $3, $5 here. But if I'm having to put it on a credit card or if I'm having to put it and watch it and it's really managed, I can tell you everything. Right. So the same thing happens. Parkinson's law, the way that we apply this to our business is we know that if we look at that one big bucket of money, then it's easy to go in and spend that money. Right. But if we've pulled out some money to, to protect it, so we pull out profit and protect it, we pull out taxes and protect it, we pull out our salary and protect it, then what is left is how we manage the company. That's where we get to pay employees. That's where we pay vendors. And I'm not saying to reduce it down so you can't pay anybody. So, you know, that's where we'll talk about the instant assessment. But it's about, as you said, being really honest and clear and truthful with the numbers. Can can I really afford the lifestyle that my business is leading? You know, do I really need to have bottled water brought in or could I get a filter? Right. You know, do I really need to be paying this for my merchant fees or should I rework them? It makes you look at everything and think about it, but it preserves funds. It preserves. I know when my husband and I first got married, we merged bank accounts mm. and 
we both uh, worked in business offices across the street from malls, which is just a <laughs> tad dangerous. <laughs> and, you know, we're young and, and we had we were making good money. But what, what happened was I would look in the bank account and see there was money, and I'd go hit, at that time, Rich's or Macy's on my walk to the food court, <laughs> and he would hit Little Best pair of Buy. Shoes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I'm just, it, it's hard. You walk through those stores, and you see things, and you look at the bank account. There's money there. And so I would buy. Well, I would know that he'd been at Best Buy during lunch, looked at the same bank account, and next thing I know, you know, we, we both come home, and we have an overdraft, and we're like, why do we have an overdraft? <laughs> well, because we both spent by looking at the same bucket. Right. And so even in our home, we both took like a certain amount of money and moved it to other accounts and said, these are our play accounts so that we won't impact anybody else right. and we won't impact our family. But it's that same process. Right. Okay. So I, I mean, I love it. I mean, everybody who's a, a longtime listener knows that, you know, we have our finances locked down because my husband's a lunatic. I mean, so, like, <laughs> so you know, you know, there's no not locking those down. But I, I like what I was attracted me to this is that I feel like a lot of times a conversation about finances and money and how to approach it in your business can get lofty and get confusing. And I love the way this concept I feel to me drills it down very clearly. And it's funny because I, I didn't know that you came to it because it was a system that you were, you know, coincidentally, practically identically using when you came upon uh, the actual, you know, uh, Mike's thing. But it's funny because when I listened to it on the Biz Chicks pod podcast, I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, wow, this is a lot of the same things that we do. Not labeled right. this way, not the same exact, you know, the bank accounts and different things, but we have always employed many of these same, um, you know, an, uh, analysis. I don't know how other yes. and practices. Strategies. Yes. yes. And so I thought, okay, this is a good way to bring it to everybody. So what would happen now? What would we be, what would we do next to continue to help bring clarity? Michelle, would we go to the instant assessment or would we st have more conversation about how it applies to an interior design firm? What do you want to do next to help everybody? So, um, I think what I'd love to do is just kind of finish talking through the process of how we're going to um, look and analyze the, the information, okay. and then let's jump into the instant assessment. Okay, good. Um, okay. You're, you're in the driver's seat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here the, the, the big overall picture is, and, and I'm going to tell you why we're going to look at all the numbers, and then we'll look at the numbers. Okay. So we've talked about total revenue. We've talked about materials and subs. We've talked about real revenue, which is what I really have to run the business on. And then the next category is expenses, and expenses is the same right, is what we have right now. They're called operating expenses. It's the same as what we would have if we were looking at a profit and loss. Um, and then what we do on the, um, on the profit first side is after we take out expenses, where your profit and loss statement would, would say net income, we're going to break that down into all the subcategories. So what does net come really mean? It is a combination of a few things. It is a combination of the owner's tax burden, right? Okay. Um, because it's part of your salary. So right. remember that whole HR department conversation. So it is, um, we have to be able to save for the owner's salary, which is their bring home pay. We want to be able to save out for um, the tax burden for the owner, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. we would do that anyway. And then we want to be able to save for profit. In addition, as you advance through Profit First, I have even more accounts. I put in, you know, an employee match and an employer match into my 401k. Well, because I put in at such a high level, just like you would if you were at corporate, I better save that money out. You know right. what I mean? Because it's it gets gone really, really fast, especially when you're trying to put in, you know, eighteen thousand, twenty five thousand a year. You you have you have no choice but to save that out and not bring that into your house. Right. So, you know, I now have four oh one K um bank accounts. I have a vault bank account which has three months expenses held out so that if anything happens in my company you know, it can continue to go just, it's just like the basic business that we've all, you know, heard about whether we've implemented it or not, you know, making sure you're saving for a rainy day, have three months. The same things that we hear for our personal lives and homes are the same things that we 
are trying to set up for our business through Profit First. It's just good financial health. And what Profit First does, that's the little nudge that's also different, is you actually advocate setting up separate bank accounts. It, exactly. Yeah, and okay. that's where my initial process was a little bit different in that I had two or three bank accounts, but now I have about six, right? Okay. And And that's only because, honestly, you remember when I said the goal is to work with your natural tendency, which is to go and pull up your bank account. If you're running everything through spreadsheets, if you're not consistent and you don't really update it, it doesn't do you any good. And now you've got to compare a bank account with a spreadsheet. And so that's um, the way that I had done it, which was a little more cumbersome. This is so much more straightforward. Okay. So, so what you're, let me just explain that in there. So what you're saying is a typical business owner who's paying attention and has a clue of what's going on, they might have all of their money in one bank account, but on a regular monthly basis, whatever, weekly, daily, whatever their ch choice is, to look at the allocation of their expenses and compare and mentally understand that even though the bank account says $45,000 in it, that really this much is going to rent and blah, blah, blah. And what you're saying is, is that if that is cumbersome, if it's not, um, if, if it's hard to understand, if it's not something you're going to uh, be able to live within, you're saying actually move it out into separate oh, bank yeah. accounts so that when you look at your just your you know your operating account or whatever you're looking at you know that that money is what's available for that expense instead of having to cross check to a prof uh, a spreadsheet that says oh wait how much is i putting aside for this right i'm, I'm right with correct. that right okay correct correct Yes. You know what it and reminds me is, of? You know, I'm what? sorry to interrupt you, but you know no. what it reminds me of? It reminds me of when my kids were little and we used to give them, you know, $6 a week or whatever for, uh, you know, allowance. And I, with Christy particularly, I remember I had envelopes and one was, you yes. know, giving and one was fun and one was saving and one was, <laughs> you know, birthday presents or whatever it was. And it was like, okay, so X amount that she had to give, you know, save every year to give to somebody every, every week. And she would, I would literally give her six $1 bills and she'd put a dollar bill in each. And sometimes some weeks when she was really saving up for something special, she'd say, could I not put something in my savings envelope this week, mommy, and just put two into that part because I want to buy that thing. And I'd be like, well, let's see what you're saving. Well, yeah, you've got nine $1 bills in savings. You're six years old. I think that's fine. You know right. Saying? That's exactly what it is, Louie. Yeah. That, that, you've, you've hit the nail. That's exactly yeah. it. It's also very similar to um, – the, the program that Dave Ramsey teaches, the envelope oh. system for your for your home, right? Okay, right, you right. Cash, you, you cash the paycheck. You determine which, how much is eating out, how much is paying off debt, how and you put the money. And when the money's gone, the money's gone. That's it. No more and eating that's out. That's it. There's no more. You're done. <laughs> and that, that it, it, oh, my gosh, if anything, that is the beauty of how Profit First works. Because when you look at the account and it says, I've got this amount to make payroll, and you know that won't make payroll, you, you are acutely aware. Right. So you're not going to find out next April when you do your taxes. Right. You're not going to find out in December. You're going to find out now. Yes. And so to your point, um, we will be setting up usually five main bank accounts to get started. If you're really going all in, we're going to have your five main accounts. Okay. We're going to have an income account and then we're going to have um, a profit account, an owner's pay account, a tax account, an operating expense account. And I'll tell you for interior designers that I work with, we go further and literally have a cost of goods or a materials and subs account because that is the piece that is, um, I would say, cumbersome and difficult in our industry when we are not simply labor driven for hours or flat rates, mm. but we have markup and products running through the company. Mm -hmm. So just know that we, we are seriously talking about going to the bank and setting up four, five, six accounts. Mm -hmm. So don't let that freak you out. You right. know, it, it, it's easy to do. Um, but, but moving forward, I'd love to jump in um, while we have some time and talk about the instant assessment. So okay. if anybody kind of wants to look at it on their own. Um, and, and I will say this too. This is a very simple process, but that doesn't necessarily equate to easy. Right. Okay. okay. <laughs> and I mean, it is simple to understand. It is simple to, to wrap your mind around. All right. So I'm really going to take my money and split it out and be truthful about how I'm going to use the money in the company. But consistency is key. Starting right. slowly and having success and um, 
staying consistent to what you're doing is going to be key for anything like this to work. And okay. I was just going to say, like, one of the most basic, blatant examples that I couldn't think of that comes to mind that would relate to a designer, and I'm asking you if this is correct, okay. is so you, you, you do a project, you put a proposal out for a project, you get your LOA, you get your payment where, you know, you now have your uh, presentation with the materials right now you're going to go purchase materials so you're going to make buy you know three sofas two chairs a lamp and a rug and you collect that money from the client in order to make those purchases by what you're saying is that money now would go directly into the cost of goods account it is not going to go into an operating expenses account because if the invoices from you know Kravit and everybody else equal $5,650 you go put $5,650 into that account I am understanding this yes. right yes yes so yes. don't put and, around and, and, and wonder where that money comes when the invoices come due 30 days from everybody exactly and that it- if I could say that there was one place that the interior design industry is, is um, kind of in a spiral is that they are cash flow negative. Right. They are robbing Peter to pay Paul. Peter to pay Paul. <laughs> That's exactly. And they're Peter and they're Paul and That's they're in a hot mess. Right. And so what, what that means is they are not. Listen, if I went to somebody and gave them three thousand dollars you know, for, I don't know, a table, Mm -hmm. I would expect that that $3,000 would actually cover the table that I purchased, not the table that the person before (laughs) me purchased. Exactly. Right. And so in our mind, we know that, but I would suggest to you that many business owners that I'm working with, it's not the way it's working. And oh, I know that it's not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, And in addition to that, if you were to even take a step further into how it fits into our industry. Let's say you sold that sofa to the client or table or whatever, you know, choose an object for 3000 And let's say that your payment to the vendor is 1500 and it's not going to be ready for 12 weeks. Okay. Right. So 1500 is going to be sitting in a cost of goods account so that you can pay the vendor. But that other 1500 that you're making as a profit on from markup, it's really not yours that you've earned until that product is in that client's hands. Right. You, the company hasn't really earned it. So you have to save that money out and not put it into the operation of your business. And that's where a lot of business owners get in trouble. They are using money that they have not fully earned to help their business you know, survive where if everybody came calling due at one time, they would have to shut the doors. Right. And so what Profit First does is helps you move from cash flow negative to cash flow neutral to what I call cash flow positive, mm. which means that you are in front of the bills. You know, you have the money. You are the money that the company's living on in March is truly, you know, the money that the company has to, has already earned, right. not not um, money that we're borrowing from May or June and hoping that it's going to work out. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. I love it a lot. I think it's so, I love it. I just think it's so clear and it's actionable and oh, it's yeah. so necessary. I mean, I, you know, I've had so many re- relationships with interior designers over the years and you get to be friends with people and you get to be having, you know, conversations and, you know, it is, it is really, I think one of the biggest things that a lot of design businesses struggle with is is particularly smaller businesses, obviously, you know, it's tough, you know, Mm -hmm. a smaller business, you have a single solo owner, maybe, maybe there's employee, maybe there isn't, but it's so much easier for them for a solo to lose track of this, you know, beast because when you have a bigger right. firm and you have 15 employees and all this other stuff, then you usually have more checks and balances in place. But I think solos tend to not really establish checks and balances for themselves thinking they'll have it all figured out. It'll be just fine. And it's, it's hard to be just fine if you don't set up the systems to be fine. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. Right. And I'll tell you um, the things that are, or the comments that I hear most often are, I'm in stress around money. Yes. I, I'm, I feel pained even though the profit or, or I get this, my profit and loss says I have a hundred thousand dollars. My <laughs> bank account says I have three. Right. And they don't understand the connection. Right. And 
um, you know, when I tell them that the government is going to tax you on the 100000 on the profit and loss, mm-hmm. not the 3000 in your bank account, that's a huge wake-up call. That's right. And, and, and for some of these people, it's extremely painful. I mean, it was painful for me when yes. I got hit with a tax bill yes. that I had not saved properly for. Yeah. And the beautiful thing with Profit First is it's not a once and done. So, you know, every quarter we're looking at it and adjusting for business growth or even business decline or where we want to go or new goals. And, and I love that because it's constantly moving and changing with the direction and, and we get to own it. Right. I mean, and I, I, I don't know, I'm all about ownership, right? Right. right. The good, the bad and the ugly. It's Take mine. I got to deal right. with it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So what so, happens if we are already starting out in debt? What if somebody listening is out there and thinking, well, this sounds terrific, but I'm already behind and I just did my taxes and I'm really already in the hole. Is there, there, there are ways to address that too and to help you know, dig out of that and strive to be profitable and not to repeat these mistakes the following year, correct? Well, absolutely. And, and you know, <laughs> Not implementing profit first is not going to mean that the problem goes away. If you're in debt, you're in debt, right? right? It doesn't matter which bank account you use (laughs) if you're in debt. And so, you know, I I think the bigger um, issue there is being willing to address it and do something about it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I am a big proponent with my pricing without emotion course of making sure that you're pricing what you do properly. And I know Kimberly Selden, you know, is a big proponent. Price your work, price for value, price it. So we first, we have to make sure that we are pricing appropriately. Then we have to do with profit first, we have to manage it appropriately. So let's say you are in debt. You know, I, I work with um, quite a few companies and help them do debt consolidation and help them find out, you know, other avenues to handle debt. But, but many companies have it, all right? The first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at it. We're going to acknowledge it. We're not going to lie about the story of the numbers. We're going to read them, and then we're going to let them be, and we're going to start adjusting. And so the first thing I would tell you is we will still take out our profit first, mm-hmm. even okay. with debt, because then what we're going to do is use that profit to pay down debt. Okay. But if we start a great habit of, of taking out profit and then using it to pay down debt, you will be aware that, oh, my gosh, when that debt goes away, that money comes into my house. That's right. Now you've got a good right? good um, a system right. in place and you've watched it work and That's you've cultivated it. it. Okay. That's it. So you're already in the system so that then when the debt goes away, then we don't now have to start a new system. We have a system. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there is a process in place to handle the debt, to reduce it. Part of um, Profit First is also to go through and check every expense. Is it really an expense? You know, like we talked about with the bottled water, is it really what we need? So once you've gone through and really just narrowed down what it takes to run the company, kind of um, had a moment of clarity and being honest with yourself again about is my business living below its means, at its means, or above its means, Mm -hmm. and then adjusting. Right. Um, and debt plays into that for sure. I love it. I love it. No, you have to know whatever. I mean, we do that at Window Works. We literally, you know, will evaluate every year exactly what it costs. We call it to keep the doors open. Every yep. single thing. And we know what number we have to reach every single month in order to keep the doors open. And hopefully yes. we're killing that number and well exceeding it. And, you know, Thankfully, typically we are. But, you know, in the slow months, because the industry is cyclical, January and February could be crazy. But, you know, we make steps in October, September when it's fatter to get through the slower revenue months because the nut, the, the keep the doors open stays the same. <laughs> you know, right, you, right. Know, you know, all the, you know, the, the, the mortgages and the rents and the trucks and the vehicles, they all don't go down in price because the revenues go down in January and February. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. So, so, so let, me, let me say this then to that point, Luann, that's why Profit First um, is a beautiful system is it works on percentages. And this mm-hmm. actually is an awesome segue into the instant assessment. Okay, good. So, yeah, Profit First works on percentages. So, you know, the, the beauty of that is on the months like you mentioned, let's say our heavy months, right, September, October, November, where we literally are killing it and killing ourselves at the same time. <laughs> um, you know. Those months where the money's coming in because people are buying, if we're saving 30% of $100,000, you know, it's it's good. Let's say it doesn't take us all that. So next month we make 
$5,000. We're going to save 30% of $5,000. Right. But over time, over the year, when we know what our percentages are, it's going to work out. It's going to ebb and flow just like our cash flow does. Right. And so by not using, um, if you will, hard numbers in most cases, but trying to use a percentage as much as we can, it allows us to build up extra to allow the ebb and flow that happens naturally in business. Okay, so what you're saying is instead of saying, I'm going to save $3,000 per month, you say, because that might be easy in September, but difficult in January, you say, yes. I'm going to establish a percentage that I can take out per month, and then that percentage naturally changes with the higher and the lower months. I like it. Correct, okay, correct. I love it. Okay, and so then this instant assessment where we, this is where if the designer is listening and feeling like, okay, so how do I figure out where I'm at now in relation right. to this? Okay. Okay. So the first thing that I would say is to gather your, um, your documents. Okay. That sounds like a really big, a big term, your documents. And by that, I mean, grab your balance sheet, grab your profit and loss. And I would grab my tax documents from the last year. Let's say we're going to analyze 2016 because we're just a little bit into 2017 at this point. So let's say we're going to look at all of 2016 and try to do a quick assessment or an instant assessment. So the first thing we're gonna do is you can look at your profit and loss statement and say, what was my total revenue? So you're gonna write down your actual total revenue. And then you're going to look at it and you're gonna say, what are the cost of goods? And if you have, have done any job costing in there, meaning you have any employees in your cost of goods on the profit and loss, you're gonna take that amount out. Okay. okay, just like we talked about, yep. so that it's only materials and subcontractors. And you're gonna write that on your materials and subs and you're going to subtract materials and subs from top line revenue. And what's left is real revenue. Now, for some of our designers, if they don't do the job costing, it might equal their gross profit on their profit and loss. It doesn't have to, though, but it might, right, okay. based on how they do their accounting. All right. So you're going to take your top line revenue, subtract your materials and subs, and then what's left is real revenue. Then what you're going to do is you're going to look at what were the total expenses that you paid that year, but you're not going to count anything that went to the owner of the company. Okay. okay. So if you're an LLC, you know, chances are you're not paid through payroll anyway, so you can just use the expenses that are on your profit and loss statement. Okay. Um, but if you are running payroll or you have owner's pay that shows up on the profit and loss, we want to pull it out and not count it. So we want expenses for anything that is not going to the owner. Okay. So we don't want to count the owner's 401k. We don't want to count the owner's salary. We don't want to count the owner's taxes and we don't do want we, to count profit. We don't, do we not want to count the owner's car and gas and things like that? Or do they stay in? If those are considered company, then you can leave them in. Okay. But I, you know, I, it, I would probably even take them out. A lot of times I do to look at anything that went to owner's benefit. Okay. Just so you really get a true handle yeah, on what you as exactly. the owner are earning. Okay. Exactly. So I personally like to take all, anything that is for owner's benefit. I, I don't want to see it showing up in expenses. So to me, your expenses should be your operating expenses for the company and then any employees that you have. Okay. All right. So, so a, then you. A plane ride to high point is not in this now. You're taking it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I would probably leave that in because okay. if it weren't you and you, and I'll tell you why. So if you're doing travel for business, I leave all that in. Okay. Okay. I, only because you would pay somebody else to do that exact same thing. You just not, not might not pay for everybody in your company to have a car. Okay. Okay. Understood. Okay. Right. So if it's in the normal act of doing business, because to me, that's not really owner's benefit. That's covering you to do your job as an employee of the company. I would leave that in there. Okay. Okay. Good question, though. <laughs> so, you, so then you're going to, um, you know, write down that number of operating expenses. You're going to then look at your your tax bill from, you know, when it, when you did your tax. How much have you paid in taxes? Either estimated, not sales taxes. It's nothing to do with sales taxes. Is um, income taxes uh, or federal taxes, right? And self employment okay. taxes for the owner going to write that number down and then you're going to look at your balance sheet or at payroll however you need to get the information how much the, you made in owner's pay and if you've left any in the company for profit so you're going to write down your numbers okay just going to be real honest and write them down okay then what we're going to do is we're going to look at them as a percentage so we're going to look at our profit number divided by our real revenue and go, what percentage of our real revenue did we spend on profit? So how much did we put in, in your case in a profit envelope? 
how much did we put in the owner's pay envelope or tax envelope or operating expenses. And so then we're going to have percentages, right? So we're going to know that operating expenses, let's say, is 42% of real revenue. We're going to know that taxes, we paid in 10% of our real revenue and so on and so forth. Then Mike has in the book, and, and I've seen it be, it's actually been been pretty good, I would say, um, for our industry. There are a few tweaks here and there based on, you know, if it's a home-based designer or if they have a, a storefront or something like that. But he, he has um, in his book, and, and he has it available, if your real revenue, so this is not top-line sales, right? This is the revenue to run the company. If the revenue for the company is 250000 or less, right? Mm -hmm. Then he has some suggested numbers for a healthy company. And so you're going to be able to compare your numbers of the truth of your numbers to what he's saying is a good starting point. Okay. And so in this case, if your real revenue is 250,000 or below profit is 5%. So that's a healthy amount, 5% of, you know, let's say 250,000. Um, and so that would be 12, what, 12,500, right? That mm -hmm. would be profit. Owners pay, this is the beautiful part, 50%. So 125000 should be owner's pay. Tax is 15%. So 15% of 250000 37500 We're just going to save it out. So when Uncle Sam comes calling, we got the money to hand up. It is no different than if we worked corporate, like you mentioned early on, right. and they went ahead and took it out. It's just we haven't been taking it out. So we're not going to begrudge it. We're just going to take it out. Right. Um, and then operating expenses is suggested around 30%. And, you know, I, I'm watching these numbers. I use them. I've probably done, I don't know, a couple hundred assessments. And, you know, yeah, do I have everybody running these numbers? No. So let's say that you did your assessment. And, again, you found out, let's say, your operating expenses is 40-something percent. And let's say you have no profit and your owner's pay is, you know, 40%. And so, and you forgot to pay taxes, mm -hmm. you know, so the money's somewhere. We got to yes, find out first, right. where's the money. And then we may even start as simple and as low as profit being 1%. Right, right, right. right? Let's just get in the habit of just 1% because at 1%, you, you honestly, in most cases, you won't miss it. Right. That's you the won't truth miss of it. it. But it will eventually also turn into something, yes. too. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. It's like taking one less two, chocolate chip cookie a day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, and just don't eat it. Two, yeah. And then the next quarter, like qu quarter two, we would move it up to 2%. Well, mm -hmm. when we move it up, that means we got to take it away from something. And I will tell you, in most cases, we're taking it away from operating right. expenses. Right. Because we're blowing usually, money there. We're, yes. We're just, usually, yeah. We're spending so much on the company, and honestly, the owners aren't getting paid. Right. And so what this does is it makes you stop and think, do I want the company to have this, or do I want to bring this into my house? Right. Which one do I want? And so quickly, you start to realize where you're bleeding. And as, as I say, we can just stick a Band-Aid on that, or we can clean it out. Let's mm -hmm. clean it out. Let's mm -hmm. not stick a Band-Aid, because it's, it's kind of like when you asked me about debt. Well, not looking at it, not doing profit first is Doesn't not help. going to... It's yeah. not going to solve your problem. You're still going to be in debt. Right. So let's manage the debt, right? right. Let's manage it. Let's think. Um, I just have to tell you, I, I just um, it took about, I don't know, 25, 30 people through Profit First over the last couple of weeks. And um, we just celebrated our first profit distribution because part of what we do when we save in that profit account is once a quarter, we have a profit distribution mm. like the big boys do, right? <laughs> That's and awesome. I'm, I'm telling you, I people are writing in. They're making their summer down payments. They had money to pay their taxes this year. It has just been there. It, it has been mind blowing. Um, the responses and people that feel like they are starting to really own their numbers and it's a bite at a time, a little at a time. And they're like, I now know where the money's going. I, it's the hundred dollars in the wallet. I know where it's going. Mm -hmm. And now I get to make a choice. Do I want to spend it there? And I think as business owners, it is so important to know that we have choices. Um, and some of them are going to be really hard. I mean, you know, I'm not going to lie. When when we go through some of this, sometimes it has to be you. You can't afford staff. You're paying your staff thirty five thousand while you're not getting paid. Right. You, your business can't support both of you. So who are you going to let it support? Right. The owner, 
or somebody else. And so they're, they're, you know, that's why I'm saying it's a simple process, but it's not easy. That's never an easy decision or choice, but sometimes it's necessary. And, um, well, it's the truth. You know, that's nothing, what I do is help yeah, guide them. Yeah. And I, I, I understand that fully. And I don't want anybody to think that my idea in talking about this is because, Hey, here's an easy thing to do. I think what it is, is, is that it clarifies and kind of paves the way for something that is necessary to do in an easier way. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, so absolutely. that's what oh, I yeah. feel like. I mean, and, and, and it's just like every single thing that you do. If we talk about a lot, I get interviewed on a lot of other podcasts about entrepreneurism and small business and so forth. And a lot of the conversation is about you know, isn't it hard? How have you done it all these years? And tell us the challenges and all of that stuff. And the, the reality is, is that all of that's true. It is hard to be an entrepreneur. It mm-hmm. is hard to have your own business. It is hard to be accountable for everyone and everything connected with that business. But for, for me, you know, in our business with my husband and Bill, it, it starts with everything that you just said by being very clear and very real about what can be done, what can be afforded, what cannot, making the right decisions. Because if you start from and you function and you exist in a place of strength, then when, you know, the air conditioning breaks down, it's, it stinks, but it's not a catastrophe. <laughs> you know what and I'm the saying? Money's there. That's right. what I'm and saying. The it's there. like, and I just feel like uh, so many times I talk with somebody that, is struggling financially, has a quote unquote healthy business from the aspect that they're doing business and they're in business and there's money coming in, but unhealthy in the respect of not managing what's coming in and going out. And then when that $3,000 air conditioner breaks down in their office or their studio or whatever the expense is, it is a catastrophe because it's like, I don't have that. I don't know what I'm going to do. And it's more the whoa, I I don't even begin to know which Peter or Paul I'm going to rob to do this. Mm -hmm. And how is it going to affect, you know, that project? If I take the money out of the bank account, how am I going to pay for the sofas that are supposed to be delivered in three weeks? So I just really feel like I love the, like I said, to me, I'm not the numbers person in our business and I am not a financial person. I've certainly learned a billion things from my husband over the years and thankfully, you know, have a, 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 pretty good deep understanding of all of it now but when I heard this explanation I was like see that's my language like I get that (laughs) it was like okay designers are like me (laughs) you know so right brain people (laughs) and and you know what one of the things that that um I think that a trap that can lead a lot of entrepreneurs and especially creatives they've heard these these um, descriptions, let's say, of, of company terms. And so they get confused. For example, you know, when I say, and, and Mike says, and you know, it's, it's the truth, your company's worth whatever that real revenue number says, not the total sales, right? right? It's just not because you can't, you, that's not money you get to really spend on the company. Right. And so I'll have um, people tell me that, you know, I'm a $3 million company. And the truth is they're not. I had one designer tell me that she was wildly profitable from day one, but had no money to grow. Well, that doesn't make sense to me. That's How right, can you be <laughs> wildly profitable? And see, I'm one of the ones that would go, uh, excuse me, can, right. we, can we talk? Let's dig <laughs> exactly. a little deeper into that. And so yeah, we're over a meal and she's telling me she's wildly profitable since day one, but no money to grow. And so when I started pushing, I said, so wait, wait, wait. Are you telling me that after you paid for product and after you paid, you know, employees and after you paid vendors and after you paid yourself that you were wildly profitable and you can't grow? And then she said, oh, well, I haven't been paid for a year and a half. Oh, awesome. Well, that's not wildly (laughs) profitable. That's not even profitable. No, that's right. And and why are you doing it? Like, what's the point? Why are you doing it? Well, and, 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 you know, they were looking at maybe not doing it anymore, but. I, that idea of wildly profitable without taking a salary is not, that's not profit. No. no. Right. And, and the that's the thing. The, and not that the first year or two, you don't, you know, work some things out, but seriously, come on, who can go two or three years 
and not get paid. Right. We have a high tolerance for low pay. Right, right. And that's that's wrong. That's that's it's bad. It's not good. <laughs> and it's not good. And honestly, it, it if if a few people are doing it, it hurts the whole industry. Right. Everybody hurts. So people that aren't pricing properly, which means they can't manage the money properly, it then falls back on those of us who are doing it right. We now look like we're gouging or well, like we're and that's right because overcharging and we're just charging to stay alive. Well, and the truth is because that's what happens is if you are pricing from need, that's not a good pricing model. You have to price for value that you're giving, not how right. much I like, you know, I, I price it because I need to pay the mortgage this month and that's $2,000 and this job should have a $10,000 profit margin on it, but I really need 2000 So let me price it with a $4,000 profit margin. So I definitely get it and get the 2000 in hand. And that's insanity. And you're right. It right. does hurt all of the rest of us. It hurts the entire industry because it skews down negatively the value for the services right. given and it's right. it's it's aggravating frankly so, so here's the other beautiful piece of of how i've seen profit first um revolutionize the businesses that i've worked with because part of what i do in coaching is we talk about their fear what mm. is the problem mm. right because we're the ones self-sabotaging i right. <laughs> people pay me what i tell them i'm worth they're not going to pay me you know, they're not going to come up with a number. And if right. they did, chances are it'd be lower than what I would come up with. So, you know, we're all out here pricing our products and our services, and there's some fear that's usually in the way. And so what Profit First does is it lays all the money out very clearly. So then you get to make, again, the choice to say, I'm willing to combat my fear to help the company make the money. Getting the understanding that if you're charging $100 an hour, that's not you get paid 100 That is what the company gets right. paid, right? right? We just have to take expenses out of that. And so really making it very clear, and I'm telling you, most people, it's not that a lot of them all feel like they have to go increase their prices when they work with me, but what they do is they charge for what they're already doing. Right. They understand their value and then they price for their value and then they manage it. Right. It's not enough to charge it if you're not managing it, as we've seen. You know, you, I still can have clients that are charging hundreds and hundreds an hour and can still be in trouble if you're not managing right. it over you got it. Yeah, it's really two sides of the coin is the one is to understand your value, understand what you bringing to the table, price it at the level and value that you bring to the table. And then, like you said, manage it when it comes in to not just have it go flittering away. Um, yes. You know, and and like we use the example of the, you know, the, the airfare to high point. And yes, it is an operating expense, like you said, but if at the end of the day, when you're evaluating what's left over, if you don't have enough to go to high point, you don't go. You that's know? exactly right. <laughs> you know, you just don't say, well, that's something I really need to do. If it is, then you really need to first pay your taxes, pay yourself, pay every, your employees, pay, right. and then manage that expense. And so I, uh, you know, I, I'm so grateful for you coming on the show. And I, one of the things I'm not, I, I I'm making an assumption, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong, is that you don't need to be local, Michelle, to somebody to help them and coach them in their business. Is that correct, or do you prefer? Oh, no. Okay. No, 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 no. Right. I would, I would tell you that the majority of my clients are not near me, and I don't know if you've seen what's happened with Atlanta traffic. Even my local clients don't come to me. You know, our interstates are crumbling before <laughs> us here. Aww. So, um, right. and because I, I'm all about efficiency and time management, Right. so the majority of my coaching well, I would say almost all of my coaching calls were either do through go to webinar or Zoom or Skype or something like that. We always use technology, and what it allows the designers that I work with to do is to get on the call at the beginning of our call and off the call, so they're not in the road traveling, right. you know. And we and we do it with faces, so we can read facial expressions. So um, honestly, it feels like we're in the room together. Yes. And I, yeah, and so that's the easiest thing. Um, in the world with technology the way that it is. So even my local, I mean, I do some local where we meet, but I would tell you the majority of everything I do is online that way. But yeah, face I think it's great. I so can't can think see. of who it was. Somebody, one of the recent guests, and I, I never can remember if it's somebody their show already aired or if it's somebody that I've just had the interview, you know, completed mm -hmm. it in the can and it's not live yet. But one of the designers that I recently spoke with in the last uh, three weeks said that they do 
all, like they that's how they handle their design consultations also in yes. other words there's certain markers along the way oh you know what i want to say it was natalie from a design partnership she said that there are certain markers along the way where there's face-to-face -face meetings but you know it's, i'm gonna th eight out of ten meetings nine out of ten meetings are literally by technology because exactly that. She said, just what you said. I want to walk in, sit at my desk, have the meeting, and when it's over, I'm moving on to the next project, and so does my client. And it That's increases right. the efficiency. So, right. yes, just smart. And time is too. money. Yes. It's <laughs> time the truth. Time is money. And, and I don't, you know, as much as my clients and myself, I don't want to be sitting an hour in traffic to get somewhere for an hour meeting to go home because it's going to be easy to not do it. Right. I mean, th you can show up with bunny slippers. I don't care as right. long as you got your information in front of you let's go well and i right? also so think it makes the meeting more nice. productive too because you don't spend 20 minutes of you know chit-chatting and everything else you spend two or three or five minutes or whatever but it's it cuts down on that whole like it takes us 20 yes. minutes to get going it's like yeah. i have and a there's meeting. no cup of coffee no water right. get your own let's go <laughs> exactly. let's dive in and because everybody's busy right it's the truth They're and if you can find free effective. time you'd rather spend it going for a nice walk or sit, doing something with yeah. your kids or your husband or your wife rather than you know like you said putts around in traffic so I think right. this is awesome I I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your coming Michelle I knew this was the way to do it I really thought with my my podcasting contacts I might have been able to ask somebody like Mike himself to actually be on the show but I actually when I thought about that oh no this is so much better because you talk our language so I am so grateful that you were available and and happy to do it again and just tell us how we reach you I understand listen to me look I, this is how I am with every coach that I have on the show, and now I'm talking to my listeners out there. I always express what the coach, how to reach the coach, what their services are, what their things are. You take advantage or don't take advantage. I, that doesn't matter to me because I really feel like I always enjoy enough value from the guest that that is enough. But my thank you to the guest is to let them you know, say how that they can be reached if you want to work with them. So, Michelle, if you uh, if somebody does want to work with you one on one, how do they reach you? Where Where do they find all your information? Great question. So, my website is scarletthreadconsulting.com, and Scarlet has one T in it. Uh, just so, yeah, yes, know what it's a little confusing. It right? <laughs> yeah, scarletthreadconsulting.com. You can reach me at Michelle with one L. M I C H E L E at Scarlet Thread Consulting dot com. You can find me on Facebook at Scarlet Thread Consulting. Um, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and all those other places. So I, I would be happy um, to just you know help in any way that I can. I do want to to share with you that if you want to get the Profit First book, let me say this: Mike originally, when he wrote the book, he self published it, and um, so you may see it out there. It's kind of a navy blue with green and a pig on the front really great cover mm. and then um he was approached by one of the bigger publishers and asked if they could republish it oh. and so you will now see that just in february that we have the launch of his latest book you can implement profit first with either book so i don't want anybody to think oh my gosh i've got the old book okay. you can implement with either one the systems are it's almost exactly the same there are a couple of tweaks here and there you know just like you would do it anytime you revised right. a book right um you can get the book from amazon Barnes and Noble, any of the big booksellers, and I'll tell you, a lot of people get it on Audible. And Mike is a hoot. So yes, I've listened to, to the book. Him, oh my gosh! And his podcast, yeah. he has a podcast too. I've listened he to does. the podcast, he and I've, I've listened to the book on Audible. It really is. Yes, he is. He's, he's a, a riot. Yeah. So <laughs> highly recommend that you get the Audible version, but even if you don't, get the other just to hear him because he's right. so funny. Right. He's such a great guy. Um, and I do want to let everybody know that. So if you um, get stuck or don't want to implement profit first alone and and for some companies like I'm working with a couple of companies right now that are you know well over a million dollars I've got a big um, couple of interior design firms and then a couple of blind shades and shutter companies and there is a, there are a lot of moving pieces and parts mm -hmm. to do all of that and mm -hmm. so it can be um, a lot to do by yourself then, you know, definitely I do private coaching and in my private coaching, we don't just do profit first because it ha we have to look at the whole company. Right. So we coach on the whole company and pr the profit first implementation is just part of that. I just, I think every healthy business should have it. But I also do have Luann, um, 
an online course for our industry so that if they wanted to do it themselves and try to, you know, go through and do it, it is a seven module course yeah. called Passion for Profit. If you go to my website, you'll see it on the front page as you scroll down. It says Passion for Profit and then Pricing Without Emotion is beside it. But for your listeners, I would love to offer them um, 10% off and the mm -hmm. coupon code in capital letters WDB for Well Designed Business and then the number 10. So WDB10, you'll get 10% off. You'll have automatic access, lifetime access. And you can go through, watch the modules. I've got um, spreadsheets and calculators, and there's also a mastermind Facebook group. Wow. So you'll be added to that, and um, we'll have a couple of Q and A's. So you're not just by yourself with, you know, a self-guided course. There's also um, a Q live Q and A time and a mastermind Facebook group that they can ask questions to implement it themselves. So, so that's really terrific. That's a great option for somebody who is possibly financially struggling now and doesn't have the ability to have a, a, a business coach like yourself one on one. Yes. This is an alternate way to access the information and start to get yourself on the right foot. It's passion for profits, and you go to your website, the Scarlet Thread. Is it the Scarlet Thread? Tell nope, me, just Scarlet, Scarlet Thread. Thread. Consulting, and then you can use the code WDB ten percent or ten W WDB ten. I love it. Right. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. You are right. very welcome. Well, and, and Luann, can I just say this before we wrap sure. up? Sure. And I know this is your goal to to um, just because of the great content that you bring on the podcast. The goal is to equip business owners in our industry so that they're not just surviving, but mm. they're thriving. It's the the truth. goal is for them to have, um, you know, as, as much balance as we can have between running a business and having a family or a home. But, but there's got to be some, some money that um, changes hands from the yes. business to our pockets to make it worth that. And, and I truly start, believe that it starts with us owning our own value and then being willing to own and manage the company. And I just appreciate the platform to hopefully equip people to be able to take control of their business and make money. Yeah, no, I, I just truly know that you come from every good place, Michelle. I know that you're very talented. I know that you have really actionable steps and like this programs to help people. And, you know, I met you in Charlotte at the IWCE after interviewing you and, you know, you just get a feeling about people and, uh, you're the real deal. And I really, for me to have you on the show, I've, we, we got the benefit of it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for joining me again today for another episode of a well-designed business. This podcast is a production of WindowWorks in Livingston, New Jersey, your trade resource for custom window treatments and awnings. Learn more about WindowWorks at www.windowworks-nj.com. All of our music is original music by Room 2 Productions. Please contact us if you want to learn more about original music for your business or your events.